Thanks, everybody. That was, wow, y'all are so awake. I, I just had lunch, and I'm, I'm not feeling as awake as it sounds like all of you are. Um, but just in case, it is the second day of a conference. Lots of emotion so far. Uh, we just had lunch. I know I'm feeling a little lethargic, so right before we get started, and also because we might want to pad out the time a little bit, um, let's all stand up real quick. All right, everybody get your hands up, stretch, just way up to the side. All right, let's take it left, my left. <laughs> let's take it right. All right, now bring it back up and everybody clap your hands. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, you can go and sit down. I actually, unfortunately, uh, this is, maybe this isn't a good idea to get started out on deception. Um, but unfortunately, I don't actually care that much about your, uh, your health. Really, I just wanted a picture so that it looks like everyone here is giving me a standing ovation. <laughs> so when anybody asks me afterwards how this talk went, I can just show them the picture. Like, it's awesome. It went great. Do you see? Look at, look at how they're reacting. <laughs> Thanks for playing along. <laughs> All right, cool, so we're here today to talk about concurrent feature tests. So I want to start at the very beginning. I don't want to assume any knowledge that you may or may not have. So let's define what a feature test is, because unfortunately there's a lot of different connotations for these kinds of things. So feature tests. When I say feature tests, I mean a driving a test from the UI, a test that goes end to end that ensures that a feature of your application is still working correctly. So how that might look in a real uh, kind of web application is something like this. You might have a name field, an email field, a password field, and a sign up button. What do we need to do with this? Well, we need to fill it in, and then we need to click the button. And then once that's all done, we need to go and check that something happened. We need to make an assertion. If you're familiar with those three A's with testing, right? That third one there is assertion. So we'll say something like this. We might look for some sort of flash message or modal that says, hey, thanks for signing up. And we need to assert that that's, that actually happened. Feature tests are great for this kind of stuff because it actually ensures that our applications are working the way that we intended them to and that we haven't made uh, any sort of regressions when we make changes to our application, when we, make, uh, when we do refactoring, and all those sorts of things. So ideally, a feature test, one, represents real users, and two, they provide confidence in our system as a whole. But if you've written a lot of feature tests, and just a real quick show of hands, who in here has written feature tests before for the application? Oh, a lot of people, turns out. Uh, you all know there's kind of a dark side to these things. Because while we'd ideally like them to represent real, real users, they only represent real users sometimes. I don't know a lot of users who can click around in a browser as fast as Selenium will click around in a browser. Um, and oftentimes, we can accidentally start interacting with things in a test that a real user could never actually interact with. For instance, if that uh, DOM node is actually hidden, Selenium doesn't always tell you that. And so you have to actually know and be able to correct for those things. And they provide confidence in our system when they aren't just sort of randomly failing all the time. And uh, judging by the laughter, you've probably experienced this, right? And why does that happen? Well, I mean, JS happens. <laughs> you just don't know, especially in this day and age of really rich client-side applications that rely heavily on JavaScript, we don't know what the state of, that, of our DOM might be. Um, DOM nodes can go stale in between checking if a DOM node exists and then checking if it has the right value in it. Uh, DOM nodes can just disappear, or they might appear asynchronously. You might try to wait on Ajax to fire, and then in between Ajax firing and actually rendering anything into the DOM, you do a query, and then nothing's there. All sorts of problems, all these sort of timing issues can start to crop up. And this is where you get the test suite that's like, just rerun it, it's probably fine, it's not a big deal. And that degrades your confidence level. How can you actually be confident in your, in your tests if, if you have to just rerun them and hope that they pass? Beyond any of this stuff, though, there's, 
the big problem, the problem that we all talk about with feature tests, they are slow. Orders of magnitude slower than any unit tests that you might write for your application. Because I mean, what are you doing? You're starting up a browser and you're running through a browser and it's hitting your application and it's going down into a database and it's executing uh, SQL queries or whatever the case may be. And that just takes a lot of time. Um, the problem though is like, they're also useful. So we want them, uh, but these are the trade-offs. So identifying all these trade-offs and trying to think about ways that we might be able to solve that stuff. Utilizing some of the power of Elixir is why we decided to build Wallaby. Um, I think this is the cutest GIF uh, of, of a dancing Wallaby that there is. But if you have a better GIF of a dancing Wallaby, I'd love to see it. Um, so what are the goals? So what does Wallaby do for you? Wallaby manages multiple browsers for you at a time. It's concurrent by default and it assumes asynchronous interfaces everywhere. We assume you're using JavaScript um, because, let's face it, you probably are. So that's enough uh, chat. Let's look at the TLDR. I realize that that's why you've all come here. You just wanna see the code. Um, so let's look at it. So remember this example. We have a name, an email field, and a password, and a sign up button. Let's build a test. So this is what a test might look like. By the way, I'm gonna go really fast through this and then we're gonna break it down, so don't, don't stress out. Uh, we write a test, we're gonna say the test that users can register, we'll get a session. Once we have that session, we need to go visit a page, and then once we do that, we need to find the form. After that, we'll fill in some stuff, we'll click a button, and then we'll go and we'll assert that uh, something actually showed up by getting the text out of a flash message, asserting the message and saying, hey, hello, you actually uh, logged in, boom. <laughs> There's our test. So we'll go through this real slow and we'll try to break down each piece. And uh, ideally here, I'm gonna give you an idea of how you might structure these things. Really what I wanna do is not give you a textbook like here's how well Olive does. If you wanna do that, you can go read the readme. But ideally, you'll actually start to understand um, some, a little bit more about Ecto, a little bit more about Phoenix, maybe a little bit about plugs. And you'll also start to learn about how we kind of manage these things. So let's break it down. What we're gonna talk about here are sessions, we're gonna talk about queries, and we're gonna talk about actions. So we'll start with sessions. So a test session typically looks something like this. We start with a test, that test talks to Wallaby, Wallaby talks to Phoenix, Phoenix talks to Ecto, and then you get data back eventually. That's the idealized version. What's actually happening under the hood is something a little bit like this. Wallaby's actually managing a pool of browsers for you. Uh, right now, it's a pool of phantoms, if you use phantom.js. Uh, coming soon will be support for uh, Selenium and Chromium. That is, we'll talk about that later. Um, and we use Poolboy to actually manage this pool for you. So if you use Poolboy, you're familiar with that. If not, you should go check it out. It's a great library. When you actually want to start running a test, the first thing you do is you uh, tell Wallaby to give you one of those browsers. That browser then talks to Phoenix, and then when you're done with it, you just put it back in the pool. Pretty straightforward stuff. The way that looks like in code is this. We simply tell Wallaby to give us a session, and then on exit, uh, this is, would be part of you know, your test case or whatever, uh, you'll end the session. And I'm showing you this code. We actually give you this code to drop into your application. You don't have to write this yourself, but it's worth going through it just so you understand how it all works. Of course, if you have multiple browsers talking to a single Phoenix, the Phoenix is talking to Ecto, Ecto is then responding, you have to have some way to sanitize that data. This is why concurrent feature tests are sort of an interesting problem, right? It's because the browsers and Phoenix doesn't know, you know, it's just, they're just calling into the database, right? The data is whatever is in the database. And so you could end up with unsanitized data. But luckily, uh, Ecto is awesome and actually provides support for this kind of thing out of the box, thanks to all the work that James Fish did. Um, and we can actually take advantage of sort of nested transactions and, uh, and all the, the trans, uh, transaction um, ownership model stuff that he implemented for Ecto2. So we can avoid this problem. The way that looks is something like this. We take a single browser, and when we talk to uh, Phoenix from that browser, 
we actually pass up a whole bunch of ownership metadata. That ownership is like the ownership of the transaction that we're currently in. And then all of that gets pulled out of the request in Phoenix via, uh, via a plug and then passed into Ecto so that we actually can understand you know, who owns this transaction and, and, how, and uh, if it's safe to, to run more transactions or, or to roll back or whatever. In code, it looks something like this. Uh, we'll break down this down line by line. So the first line here is uh, Ecto adapter, adapters SQL sandbox checkout. So we're just getting, we're checking out um, ownership, and ownership of our, of our uh, in our connection pooling. The next thing we do is we, we craft some metadata. And that is gonna be stuff like you own this, you own this transaction or, or what, what the case may be. And then finally, we just pass that into Wallaby. Wallaby knows how to inject that correctly and then, uh, and then have that get passed up to the, uh, in the browser. Obviously, you need to be able to rip this stuff out, like I said, with a plug in your Phoenix application. And so the configuration in your Phoenix application looks like this. Inside of your endpoint, you just add a plug. So that uh, plug Phoenix Ecto SQL Sandbox, you can add that into uh, an if condition, that way it doesn't get added like in production, let's say. Um, and that plug will do all that work for you. Um, and you can just start taking advantage of this now. If you have Phoenix Ecto in your depths, in your, in your mixed depths, you already have this. You can just use it right now. So it's ready to go. Cool, so that's sessions. Let's jump into queries. Sure. How do you handle seeding a, a, a session? Uh, seeding? Yeah, like if you have like a minimal amount of set of uh, data that you want for a session. And, and oh, that's sure, that's a great question. Seeding whenever you start so, a new session. Yeah, so, so the question is how do you, um, how do you seed uh, a session like if you need data like in the database already? Um, because you've already checked out the ownership, um, you can run transactions inside of your test setup and it'll, it'll handle that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. All right, cool, so let's, uh, let's talk about queries a little bit. So going back to our example again, we have this alert message thing, right? So thanks for signing up. And the HTML for that might look something like this, right? Div, uh, you get a, uh, is it an alert uh, div, uh, you have a span with a class of message and with a, some, you know, text. We can write queries against this DOM uh, like this. We can take our session and we simply pipe it into a find. And we can use CSS selectors. Uh, and we kind of assume everybody knows how to use CSS selectors. Uh, they're pretty ubiquitous at this point. And this will allow you to go and, and, uh, and actually get that DOM node. Uh, if you want to use XPath or you want to use something else, you actually can specify that there. Uh, but you have to pass in a tuple. By default, we assume you want to use CSS. If you have something more complicated, like for instance a list of users, right? You have a list of users, uh, you have, this isn't technically a list, right? It's divs, but who, I don't know that any of us, I haven't used a real list because it's styling and whatever else um, in a long time and rip the, uh, rip the web, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so we have a list of users, uh, those ha users have names, they have emails. Um, and we want to write a test against this. So let's write a test that's like, let's get all the users' names. So the first thing we'll do is we'll find all the users. And we'll try to do this. We'll say find user. But as you can see, there's actually multiple users here. There's two different user uh, divs. And so unfortunately, this is an ambiguous query. And we'll throw you an error that says, this query is ambiguous, we'll tell you exactly why. We tried to find it this many times, we expected it to find it once, we found it twice. And if you wanna fix it, uh, drop this snippet into your code. And that snippet would look something like this. It would tell you to specify an explicit count. So if you wanna find both of these, you can do that. And again, our error messages will just tell you how to do it. Once you have that, you get an array back, or excuse me, a list back, too much Ruby. Um, you get a list back, and you can map over that list and then call more functions. So let's say we want to get the names of both of these users. You could do that. You could uh, just use enum.map as you would for anything else, and then 
go find their names. And then finally, if you wanted to get the text out of those names, you could, again, pipe it into another map and just call text. And then you would get, the, you'd get those names out. And you could make assertions on this or where the case may be. If you want to do more scoping, you could, uh, we can look at different ways to do that. So let's say that we want to uh, just get Grace's email here. We can actually write a query that looks something like this. We can say, go find the user with text that matches Grace Hopper. And that would scope our query down to a single user node, because there's only one node that has that text in it. And then from there, we could go get the email and get the text from that email. And again, we get Grace Hopper. As we talked about in the beginning with some of our caveats, when we go to actually query this stuff, we don't always know what's happening because timing issues, because of our favorite friend. Um, and you know, we might be rendering stuff, we might be, in the middle of, uh, we might be in the middle of doing an asynchronous call, whatever the case may be. And so we assume that everything, uh, when, you talk, when you try to talk to a, a browser, is not gonna be successful. So we actually will try to block for a determined amount of time until this thing actually becomes true, until you can actually verify that query and it returns you something. And if it times out, eventually we throw an error that says, hey, this, we couldn't ever find this. You know, and, you can, and you can configure that timing. All right, so queries. Let's talk about actions a little bit. So we have a simplified version of our example. We have a name field and a sign up button. And the HTML for that probably looks something like this, right? You've got an input field with a label and a button. If we want to actually write tests against this, we can do so like this. You can say session, pipe that to a fill in, and you can see here what we're saying is fill in name. Um, it's an interesting API decision, but we, we sort of assume that you don't actually really want to couple yourself that much to your underlying CSS. And that's brittle. And your CSS probably changes a lot. Because, you know, styles and flat design is in vogue, and then all of a sudden material design is a thing, and then, you know, and your CSS classes are just going to change. And so tying it to that is a place where you will start to have issues long term with your tests. And so we try to, we're trying to um, create an API that allows you to attach things to, maybe, to less style presentation um, and something maybe a little more descriptive, right? So you can actually read this as a full test and say, you know, fill in the name with whatever the text is. That also goes uh, for buttons. So if we want to click on the button, we can just say click on and then the name of the button. And that'll go out and find the button. Under the hood, we do all this with XPath. Um, and so it allows us to be really flexible with our querying for these sorts of actions. And we can also, we don't have to scope it to just, the, to just name like that, which is the label text, as you can see. Um, we can also use the name of the field itself. So we could say something like fill in username, which happens to correlate to the name of the input field. If we want to extend this and add you know, a checkbox that's like, hey, save my login information or you know, keep me cached in cookies or whatever it is, um, we can do that. And then the way we would extend the test here is we just say check. Right, you want to check that box. And again, you can pass it the label text, and it'll find it and go and check, it, and check those things. There's a whole bunch of other actions that you can use. Uh, you can use you know, fill in, as we've seen, choose uh, for radio buttons and that sort of stuff. You can select from select boxes. Uh, you can attach files. Um, uh, and so you can do uh, file uploads. Um, we're working on some others, like being able to drag and drop out of the box. Uh, that's a sort of all like upcoming work. Um, but yeah, but by out of the box, you get a whole bunch of these different, uh, different helpers to be able to uh, use to fill in forms. And they're all chainable, they're all pipeable, as you'd expect. So that's a bit about Wallaby, right? We have sessions, queries, and interactions. Sessions allow you to, to create multiple uh, concurrent browsers all running against uh, a single Phoenix instance. Uh, queries allow you to interact with the DOM, or excuse me, uh, to query the DOM. Interactions allow you to uh, interact with the DOM. And interactions also follow the same blocking procedures that we use for queries and everything else. It all runs on the same engine. 
Um, and there's still a lot of other stuff that we want to do with it. There's, uh, we want to add more support for, um, for Selenium and for Chromium, as I talked about. Um, if you've ever done development against Phantom, um, like let's go have a beer together and we'll just cry and it'll be awesome and we'll share the pain together. Um, so there's still a lot more work to do there. Um, uh, we're talking a lot about trying to help Eva eliminate even more risk conditions. We're trying to work on errors and provide better error messages for people. Uh, so if you want to get started with this stuff, you can uh, go uh, to GitHub where it is. Uh, if you want to look at these slides, they're up here on speaker deck. Um, and finally, I want to talk about one, one uh, other thing uh, tangentially related to all this stuff. But I want to tell you just a little, like a quick story, and I want to talk, stop and talk a little bit about the Elixir community and how awesome it is. So about a year, not a year ago, but about the beginning of this year, I kind of like set up some rules for myself, and the third rule was that I was going to contribute a lot more stuff. And I was going to talk more, and I was going to try to like uh, get, into, get involved in the community more. And about a month later, I actually went and, and made the initial commit for this repo, and I've work, been working on it since then. Um, and I just want to stop and say, like, the Elixir community is awesome. Uh, the Elixir community is amazing. And I don't know if you guys are as excited as I am about being here and seeing all the awesome stuff that's being built, um, but we're at an awesome time right now. We're just at a, a fantastic point in time in this community where we can really get involved and contribute and we're all learning together, we're all growing and sharing. So uh, if you remember nothing else from this talk, I hope what you remember is like, let's just build awesome stuff together. Let's go out and continue growing and learning and sharing that knowledge. So thanks. Uh, I have a lot of time for questions. Um, that's hopefully, I kind of went quick because I wanted to get some more questions than anything, because I think that'll be more interesting. So um, yeah, so let's do questions. Hey, Chris, thanks. That was an awesome talk. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so just one question, really. So I'm one of the unfortunate ones that still work with Ruby. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried running this against the Rails app? Because that might be a way for me to sneak like an elixir into my work. Yes. Life. I love that suggestion. Um, it's totally possible. All you need to do is dial the pool size down to one. <laughs> yeah, so, so literally if you just say pool size one, you can run it against whatever application that you care about. Yeah. I should write a blog post about that. <laughs> Hey, Chris, thank you for this. Um, so I've had a lot more experience with Hound. Um, okay. And the thing I noticed about Hound, and I've noticed about your examples, is they're still really coupled to the, the HTML structure of the mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff I've done in Ruby is more text-based, using like i18n and unvote, you know, for the page and for the test. Um, so is the text node that you have like a visible text? I, don't, I was looking through the docs, I didn't see the mm -hmm. distinction there. Is that mm -hmm. what that's for? Yeah, it's so we try to emulate real users whenever possible. So if you try to, for instance, interact with a DOM node that a user couldn't see but is in the page, we actually throw an error and say a real user could not interact with this. Uh, it needs to be visible because of these reasons. Uh, along with that, uh, so for any of the text stuff that we're getting, it'll provide you whatever we believe is visible text to a real user. Um, so you could. You could do the same thing with like figuring out this text should be you know I eighteen and whatever and and just and use that instead. So uh, and it should use the same stuff. Does that answer your question a bit? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and you can you can nest this. So the question, the follow on question there was like uh, being able to scope uh, instead of getting like the full page. Yeah, if you continue to provide scoping, um, we'll just give you the text at wherever you're scoped at. Other questions? I think there's some over here. Hi, uh, I'm giving a talk in Windy City Rails about using page objects to kind of abstract the coupling of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, text and CSS to your tests. Make the test less brittle. Have you experienced any? Uh, have you tried using page objects in this uh, in Elixir? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just call them page modules. Is really the only difference. Um, uh, 
that is actually, so this is actually a, a bigger question that we have, and, and it's something I hope that as more people uh, maybe try this stuff out, um, we'll, we'll be able to have a bigger conversation about, but I'm of the opinion that we should always be using some sort of page module type thing. I think that is a good way to encapsulate um, some pretty messy logic about, you know, coupling to DOM nodes, coupling to CSS, that sort of stuff. I don't, I don't have a good answer for it yet other than to use these best practices, which I feel like is not uh, a holistic enough answer. I would actually really like to eventually figure out a way to almost encourage people with the framework to, to, to put that stuff um, in variables like that you can change or like in a function. I don't know how to do that yet um, other than just telling people. But if you have ideas about how that API could grow and change, I would love to talk to you about it. So, um, other questions? Um, how, do, how is the synchronization between Wallaby and Phoenix done through the browser? Uh, so, like, say that we, that we were using Phoenix as a backing for a front-end JavaScript app that lived in a separate project. Mm -hmm. What kind of plumbing would we need to add to that intermediate app for, to enable parallel tests? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, as long as Wallaby can run against your page, and if it's being backed by Phoenix, and if you don't screw around with the user agent string, which is where we store all the metadata, um, then it should actually be fine. Um, in terms of getting that running in your environment, that's, as you know, with like trying to get stuff working with big single page applications, like it's pretty ad hoc, it's pretty bespoke, it's like whatever you have figured out for your, um, for your company. It's, but it's, yeah, but as long as, as, long as, you're, as long as you are talking to Phoenix and we can hit your page and that page is talking to Phoenix, it'll just work. Uh, as, assuming you configure everything, yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, I think the killer feature here is being able to parallelize uh, on, a, on a clean instance of the database, the sandbox as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's just awesome. Um, I've done a lot of work with the protractor. Mm -hmm. um, and it has blocking functionality as well. Could you maybe expand a little bit on, on how technically you implemented uh, blocking? And does blocking apply at, at, each, uh, at each line? Um, I imagine you're, you're just pulling on the DOM with some kind of frequency. Uh, yeah. But, but perhaps you could elaborate first. Sure. Um, so we pull the DOM. Uh, essentially, we, you, we take your query, the thing that we believe you want to do, and every one of those actions will block until the DOM ends up in the state that you've specified in your query. And we do just retries until we either time out or until it becomes true. Um, and so every action blocks until, it become, until, until one of those two conditions happens. Um, it definitely adds overhead to your tests doing it that way. Um, the the, the trade-off there is like, it works with JavaScript. Um, and it's, if someone has a better idea of how to do it, like if there's some magic JavaScript thing, like I would love to know how to do it. Essentially, all the other, uh, all the other test frameworks do more or less the same thing. Um, even in the JavaScript ones, it's all done via set timeout and they try again. Uh, and then eventually either throw you an error or, or they return you a result. Uh, so yeah, so every operation in Wallaby blocks up until your query becomes true. Just one follow-up. Uh, each of the tests is running in a separate What's, process, it, I imagine. Each of the tests is running in a separate process, I imagine. So I guess there's overhead, but it's 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 all concurrent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every test case, um, every test case obviously is running in its in in its own process or, or whatnot, um, and we disable. We don't do timeouts. Uh, internally in a Wallaby, like there is the global timeout that like we will will break your test eventually. Like if you specify like only retry this for five seconds, we'll do we'll we'll break at that point. But we just say we like for all the gen server calls that we do internally, uh, we have some agents that run that store state for like uh, we capture JavaScript logs and JavaScript errors and then rethrow those for you in the in the in the test run. And so that stuff gets stored in like an agent. And in, in all those calls that happen, we set the timeouts to infinity because they get caught by an, a, a larger exception. Um, or 
the test timeout times out eventually. Does that answer your question a bit? Cool. Hi, Chris. So I'm one of those people who've written literally thousands of tests in Capybara against Rails apps and Angular apps um, and have lost months of my life waiting for them to run. Um, right. There are always two really big problems, and I'm totally blown away that you've solved the first one, which is the sharing of database connection between the test and the browser. Like, that's always caused enormous problems. So my jaw hit the floor when you described that. So I just want to say how impressed I am with that. Um, the other big problem that almost made me give up on that kind of testing is something that happened with pretty much every project, is we would build out the app um, in the first version. We'd write all these tests that automated the forms. And then design would come along. And of course, modern design requires us to re basically replace all of our form elements with JavaScript elements. So suddenly, our selects aren't selects, they're divs. And our checkboxes aren't checkboxes, they're divs. And all of those widget operating um, functions start breaking. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about how to mitigate that kind of problem? Like beyond training your designers not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so like my, my less obnoxious answer is um, by default, all of our actions are assume you have real HTML, right? A select looks for a select. And in fact, um, this, is, this gets into limitations with WebDriver. Like if you try to go click on things, like if you try to click a link in WebDriver and the link doesn't have an href tag, it's not a link. So it can't click it. So we actually find those sorts of problems for you. Like if your test fails because of that, we actually find that problem and we throw that in the air. So we're like, I can't click this link because it's missing this href tag. That's not really the answer to your question. Um, but, so having DOM just like kind of building JavaScript widgets, we do give you all the underlying stuff that we use as part of the DSL. Um, you need, you'd have to look at the, the docs. You need to scope things like node.click after you can find it. There's nothing stopping you from just like finding the elements that you need to click on and then clicking on them. Um, so we, we give you all the tools to build that stuff. All our actions are just built with the same stuff that you can use in your test. Um, it's just gonna be more work, unfortunately. Uh, as, is, as tends to happen when you askew um, good semantic web stuff, as we all do, <laughs> unfortunately. Just a follow-on to that, um, if you can't select your element in your test, you also probably don't have a very accessible website for people who need assistive technology. So that might be a way to push back on designers um, who want to do things that make it hard for you to find things in your test. Probably means if someone's using a screen reader, they can't probably find it either. So. Yeah, I, I can't echo that enough. Um, actually, a really, you know the best way I've found to solve this problem? Uh, I did this once with, to some degree of success. Um, I sat down with a designer and, who was doing, who was building sort of these widgets um, and we actually used a screen reader and that kind of drove the point home like, oh, boy, that sucks. Because <laughs> um, you just, if you don't use a screen reader on a regular basis, you don't know and you don't know how broken the web is in a lot of ways. So it's worth everybody's time. You have one installed on your machine already if you're using a Mac. So just go turn it on, try it one time. It's very enlightening. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, about a year ago, uh, I was working on an application that had uh, a solar backend, and so we had, you know, to play some tricks with, uh, uh, you know, a mutex and blocking so that the solar tests wouldn't all step on each other with parallel tests and rails and all that. Um, have you bumped into any edge cases that uh, come up often enough that you just say we can't run these tests in parallel, like? Mm -hmm. um, w just what are some examples of things that are just too hard, at least right now, to parallelize? Well, I mean, um, right now, uh, we live in, one of the great things about living in Elixir is that you can just um, have gen servers. We can't roll those back. So if you go m manipulate, as part of your controller action, as part as whatever this feature is doing, manipulates external state outside of Ecto, we have no control over that. That's your application. We wouldn't sort of presume to know how to roll any of that stuff back or to correct for that. 
Um, and so stuff like that, like if you're calling into external, if you're calling into other gen servers and mutating state somewhere else, you're gonna have to either make that test not async um, or you're gonna have to roll it back manually yourself after every test run. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, currently, um, the, other big, um, the other big gotcha for this is channels. Channels, obviously, if you're doing a lot of uh, uh, intercommunication between browsers via channels, they don't filter via the same mechanism that Ecto does. So while it's not um, super complicated to, to pull that same metadata out, in your channel and then use it to filter out like broadcasts. Um, it's not something that we, again, presume to do for you. Like, I kind of tend to feel like we should just be giving people snippets for that kind of stuff so that you can use it in your application. So those are the two big gotchas right now. Um, blog posts coming soon on how to kind of get around both those things. Um, it's, we thought about it for about uh, two seconds on, on how to like, how would we solve that for people and then realize like we'd probably get it wrong and we'd just make your life harder if we tried to solve it for you. So it's more about, a, just kind of have to know that sort of stuff. Anything else? Yeah, way in the back. So this is just a potential solution for the question about brittleness in um, the tests when designers change uh, the classes and attributes. Uh, we use this at ThoughtBot and it works really well. Mm -hmm. Is uh, We actually don't match on the classes, IDs, or elements, and we use data attributes. Mm. So we'll create basically a data role and name it something specific to how we're using it in the test. Um, so we might do like data role users, and uh, so we match on that in the tests, and the designers just know uh, if they're gonna change the class or the element, then mm -hmm. they just keep the data attribute, and basically the tests never break, so. Oh, cool. I would, if you have time after this, we should chat more about it. I'd love to see um, some of the implementation of that. Like, that sounds very interesting to me. Uh, not a, that wasn't a thing I'd thought about before, so that's cool. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out, y'all. <laughs>